Sweden and Denmark in the background. Welcome to the GCN show. From the start line of the MS-150 in Richmond, Virginia, welcome to the GCN show. Florida, Korea, stage five. Welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up, we've got some great new tech. We wrap up a busy and excellent week in pro racing, and we search for the toughest climb in the world. <laughs> well, last year's looking for somewhere to go on his summer holidays, isn't he? So yeah, he is. the time is right. Yeah. A few months back, we asked you to help us find the steepest climb in the world. You sent in loads of amazing and frankly terrifying footage. Ah! But this week, a couple of things have been getting us thinking. Just what is the hardest, the toughest climb in the world? That's right, we've been searching for climbs for Lasty to suffer up during the Tour de France, and we stumbled across this, which is called the Col de Gendry. It's in the French Alps, and it's the second highest road in Europe. So at the top, you'll be at 3,151 meters above sea level. And if you start at Le Clapier, it goes 26.9 kilometers up. And in that time, you will climb 2,458 meters, which gives you an average gradient of over 9%. That is absolutely brutal. And a lot of it is on gravel, I oh, forgot to say, oh making it God. even more epic. Okay, yeah, that is a truly epic climb. But a lot of people out there think that this is the hardest climb in the world. It's called Pozza San Glicente. It's in the Lombardy region in northern Italy. And it has an average gradient, an average of 18%, and Ooh. it's over 10 kilometers long. The worst bit is 35%. Oh Although on the flip side, it is paved. Well, sort of, because I was looking at this climb. There are some cobbled sectors. All right, yeah, there's cobbles. And there's a lot of grass yeah. as well. More grass than you'd averagely expect. I'll and to be it. frank, I would take gravel any day over cobble, so that really yeah. is a brute of a climb. Although, interestingly, on the climb by bike ranking of climbs in the world, it's only 13th. And the winner in that category is the Mauna Kea, which is in Hawaii. That one's only 6.1% average gradient, but it's 68.6 <laughs> kilometers in length. It's a long way. That is a long old climb, isn't it? That is a long climb. Although, I've got to say, I take exception to that being ranked as harder because a 68.8 kilometer long climb at 6.1% just sounds like a really long and very slow bike ride. Yeah. Whereas I think I would genuinely struggle at 18% for 10 kilometers. I think that would crack me. Yeah, less of a ride, more of a walk, isn't it, really? It's quite torturous. Yeah. Uh, well, what we would really love is for your contribution to this once again. Uh, if you could let us know what is the hardest climb near you or the hardest climb that you've ever ridden and send some footage and that'd be fantastic. And let us know why it was hard as well. Was it the gradient? Was it the surface? Was it the altitude? Or was it something completely different? Photos would be fantastic, but video footage would be even better. You can send it to us as a message on Facebook or indeed to climbs at globalcyclingnetwork.com and we'll be using that in a future GCN show. I'd like to contribute, Dan, I really would, but I don't want to get anywhere near the climb of Draycott in the Mendips in the UK ever again. That's my nemesis. I will not take photos really? or video. Maybe descend it with a camera at the back and we'll reverse the footage. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. We shall begin cycling shorts this week with news of the Trans Am endurance race, and I'm afraid to say that the news is not good. Just as the race leader Evan Deutsch was only 300 miles away from the finish in Yorktown, news came in of a tragedy which had taken place a little bit further back down the course. That's right, 61 year old Eric Fishbein from California was riding across Kansas when he was hit from behind by a vehicle and killed. By all accounts, he was a really experienced cyclist and had been training super hard for this event, as you could probably tell, in fact, from his 240 kilometer per day average over the course of the Trans Am. Uh, it does seem at the moment as though the event is set to continue because the rides at New Eric say that that is what he would have wanted, but he will undoubtedly be at the forefront of everybody's minds. Yeah, and ours as well. It again brings tragedy to the world of ultra-endurance cycling. This is the second high-profile death this year following the loss of Mike Hall during the India Pacific wheel race. 
Now, hopefully, these two events are linked tragically only in terms of timing and not actually a reflection on ultra endurance racing or indeed the state of the roads. That's right, because it's not the only high profile endurance event taking place in America at the moment. There's also the RAM or the Race Across America, which is the one where you can indeed receive outside assistance. Uh, at the moment, Christoph Strasser is storming the solo men's event. He looks set to take a fourth title at the RAM. Meanwhile, Sarah Cooper is well over half distance and leading the solo women's event. Hopefully everyone racing across America in either event stays safe at the moment. I tell you what, Dan, there is definitely a job to do to help make cycling safer across the world. But the good news is that people are campaigning really effectively as well to help improve conditions. One uh, of the most effective, in fact, certainly in terms of raising awareness, as well as putting a smile on people's faces, is actually taking place at the moment. And it's this, the World Naked Bike Ride. To be clear though, it's not just one bike ride anymore, it's lots of different bike rides. In fact, there's been over a hundred taking place over the last week or so in cities across the world. And it's not just an excuse to let everything hang out, it is a really effective mass protest against the threat to cyclists posed by motor vehicles and it raises awareness of just how vulnerable we really are. Yeah, it's a great initiative, and it's certainly helping to raise awareness. And if you want to get involved, apparently it's not too late because more events are planned over the coming weeks. We missed the one local to us. Sorry, just to put oh, that no. yeah, A couple possible. of bits of advice for people though. Firstly, apparently disc brakes are banned from these <sighs> events. Yeah. And also, make sure that you do these events en masse because solo naked bike riding is quite controversial. Mm -hmm. I noticed in an article in the Wiltshire Gazette and Herald. That's one of that our favourites. Local police are searching for a cyclist who was seen riding along wearing nothing but a tartan hat. I tell you what, good luck to police looking for him. I certainly would not want to go looking for a naked man no. wearing a tartan hat. Incidentally, Matt's on holiday this week, but he's staying local. I don't think it wasn't hit. No. I don't know. Coincidence. I tell you what, one good thing about riding naked no tan lines. So perhaps Wiltshire's naked cyclist had just seen this tweet from pro rider Carly Taylor from the Ale Cipollini team who uh, said that in an effort to try and get rid of her embarrassing tan lines, uh, well if she's done this, what can you say? That hasn't quite worked. I think we call that the traffic light or perhaps the Neapolitan. It's a special look though Carly, hmm. but definitely. I think we'll stamp that tweet of the week. Yeah, absolutely. Although it was run close by this Instagram video which was posted by Annette Edmondson. Uh, how do you recover from your biggest career win? That win being the overall classification at the OVO Women's Tour. Well like this, uh, here is Katia Nubodoma getting some well earned rest and recovery along with Edmondson and fellow pro uh, Lauren Kitchen. That does look very cool indeed, yeah, it does, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Especially at the moment as we are sat in what is probably the hottest studio in the world. All uh, right, before we finish with cycling shorts for the week, we want to give a shout out to Red Bull because they are looking to get more people to ride to work this summer. So ditching their cars, ditching buses and ditching trains. Instead, getting themselves onto saddles. That's right. They are launching the Million Mile Commute where they're trying to get cyclists and runners to log one million human powered miles to work and you will be recording your stats on Strava. Now I think this is cracking, I can't wait to get involved. I'm all for a human powered commute to work. In fact, you better not get me started Dan because I will rhapsodise about this all day. But let it be said, if you want to get involved, just sign up. The link is in the description below this video or just search for Red Bull Million Mile Commute. Yeah, there is in fact an extra incentive for those of you in Great Britain. Uh, if you sign up and contribute just one mile out of that one million mile total, you will receive a Red Bull st uh, sample pack. That's not bad, is yeah, it? Good. Nice work. Uh, given how much we love commutes to work by bike, uh, do make sure you share any inspirational photos that you might happen to take as well. We would love to see them, as I'm sure would everyone else who follows us on social media. Uh, I can actually get involved in this one, Dan. I'm not going to go looking for Draycott and riding up the hardest climb in the world, but I do like my commute and I will take photos on it. It's been another bumper week in tech this week, and we're going to start with a big welcome back to the world of cycling for tyre brand Pirelli. They actually started sponsoring cycling at the first ever Giro d'Italia in 1909, supplied most of the field with Pirelli tyres. But anyway, better late than never, guys. They're back with three new tyres, the P0 Velo, which is their road racing tyre, the P0 Velo TT, 
which is their time trial tyre, and then the P0 Velo 4S, which is their four season training tyre. They've got a new rubber compound, they say, which lowers rolling resistance, and they've actually gone, interestingly, I think, for a slightly treaded casing as opposed to a slick one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how they compare in testing in the coming weeks, Yeah, uh, because although they've got that long pedigree in motorsport, so too do some of their rivals on road racing, uh, such as Continental and Michelin. Uh, there's going to be some big news coming out of Mavic this week, which unfortunately yeah. We can't reveal here on the GCN show, but stay tuned to the channel because that will be coming out at some point this week. And there's more news coming out of Italy from Bianchi because they've announced a brand new aero bike. It's called the Aria, but it's going to be at a brand new lower price point. Hurrah! <laughs> yeah, lower price point. Not cheap, exactly. No, not though. cheap. No. Not yet. Hopefully, though, it will go some way to helping out GCM viewer Adam Blundell, who commented under our Top 6 prototype bike video, uh, wow, I can't wait to never be able to afford these, uh, which is probably a, a really good point. But anyway, like I say, hopefully it will go some way. And it is a start, isn't it, bringing it yeah. down to lower price points, definitely. And it's certainly beautiful to yeah. look at. Uh, we don't know quite how fast it is in a wind tunnel, we've got to stress, but looking at it, a lot of the aero touches and refinements that you'd expect to see more expensive bikes are there, like the dropped seat stays and also the smooth transition from fork to down tube. It certainly does look good, as you said, oh. especially with the campy group set and the Vision Team 35 wheels as well. Anyway, if aero is not your thing, then perhaps this will be. Uh, you might have seen a couple of weeks ago, Peter Gann doing donuts uh, with a specialised endural road bike, that being a Diverge, on the top of the car. Yeah, fuck it, I wanted to do donuts. Well, amazingly, this week he's actually been spotted riding the thing. <laughs> You know what? He is a cool guy, isn't he? He reminds me in this video uh, of John Tomac, former mountain biker from the well late 80s, early 90s. And the bike looks cool too, actually. Not quite as cool as Tomac's Yeti Arc, but you know, still it's a step in the right direction. This is the, the second generation of specialised Diverge, and it actually starts to lose its road roots. It goes more down the avenue of wider tyres and actually dual wheel sizes, so you could stick road wheels in there or also smaller mountain bike wheels and tyres in there as well. And what that also does is it frees up specialised cyclocross platform, the Crux, to revert back to more of a pure cyclocross race machine whatever that even is now. Mm. But we're kind of lost with all these different niches. Yeah, well that new crux though, it is 300 grams lighter, that's certainly going to help. And they yeah. tweaked the geometry ever so slightly. Although interestingly, given that this is a bike aimed solely at off-road racing, uh, they've actually made the position longer and lower, so it's much less leisure oriented. Yeah, nice. Now one bike that is definitely going to go into legend as an epic endurance bike, possibly even with a bit of groad in there as well, is this one. So former round the world record holder Mark Beaumont uh, is hoping to reclaim the mantle of the fastest person to cycle around the globe in less than a fortnight's time in fact. His target? 80 days. Which equates to an average daily distance of 240 miles or 386 kilometres. I'm not even sure I can do one of those days. I don't think you could. No, I, I don't, don't want to try. I don't think you should try. I'm not going to try. Uh, anyway, as I said, this is the bike that he is doing it on. It is a custom Koga Chimera Premium. As you can see, he's using standard road bars, but with aero bar attachments. He's got a Corama wheel set on there with Panaracer 28mm tyres, and he's using an SMP saddle as well. No camping kit, you'll notice, and that's because because Beaumont is going to be fully supported for this round the world trip, as opposed to last time where he was completely unsupported. You mean he slept in hedges? Effectively, yes. Mm. We will begin racing news with the Tour de Suisse, which concluded on Sunday. Uh, world champion Peter Sagan took two of the nine stages, which brings his total tally of career stage wins at the race up to 15. And in that time, he's also won the outright points jersey on five occasions. Now that is a lot of trips to the podium side, but I don't think he's ever had a trip to the podium quite like this one. He's clearly not a climber, is he? <laughs> no, I guess you could say that. No, he's not. The overall victory was taken by Simon Spielak for the second time in his career, actually, and he clearly has a thing for Switzerland because seven out of his 12 career wins have been in either the Tour of Switzerland 
all the Toro Romani. They really? They have Good indeed. Good stats, Si. Thank you very much. Now, he took a commanding win on stage seven, and then after that, the overall was never in doubt. Mm. Hey guys, how's it going? Ah, oh, Statman John. Oh, it's John, what are you up to? I'm back with some more stats for you. Stat attack. This week are some stats from the Tour de Suisse, where Philippe Gilbert hit a whopping 119.25 kilometers per hour. Not bad going at all. Well, it is known for high speed descents, but was it just on the descents where they were fast, John? It's not just high speeds on the descents though, guys. Peter Sagan hit a whopping 76.2 k's per hour in the sprint finish. And also he kicked out a massive 1,417 watts for five seconds. That's quite a good effort actually, isn't it? Do you reckon you'd like to ride a triplet? Possibly. Final one for you. Ben King of Team Dimension Data, who was in the breakaway, has some impressive numbers. He burned 5,762 calories that's the same as 23 burgers, 11 Toblerones, or 89 apples. He's eating an invisible apple. What are you it's doing, remarkable. John? Right, is that it? One final thing, guys. On Dan's video about six checks to make before you go out for a bike ride, Hammy Dummock said, Apron, are you baking a cake? Well, are you? Oh, because it wasn't very really nice. No. I'll tell you what, mate, I thought you looked great. I actually borrowed that apron yesterday. Yeah, thanks for that, mate. That's right. Uh, anyway, I know we shouldn't be partisan, but I really enjoyed watching Larry Warbass take his first pro victory and indeed the first victory for his team, Aqua Blue Sport. Yeah. He's a man that works tirelessly all the time for other riders. And it was great to see that not only was he ecstatic, as you can see from this tweet, but also everyone else in the peloton seemed very happy for him too. He's obviously a very popular man within the bunch. Yeah. Rowan Dennis bookended the race with a really impressive victory on the final day's time trial. Uh, and it was a great day for his team, BMC, because they also took second with Stefan Kung and third with Damiano Caruso on the day. And Caruso got second overall as well. Yeah, Quite it wasn't time. just a great day for them in Switzerland because their Swiss rider also took overall honours at the Route du Sud in France, where he also won the mountains jersey and the points jersey as well, that rider being Sylvain Dillier. Meanwhile, Cannondale continued their momentum this season by winning the final two stages with Pierre Roland and uh, Tom Scully. Yeah, that was nice to see, wasn't it? Uh, elsewhere, Rafa Micah showed that he's getting ready for the Tour de France with a great win overall at the Tour of Slovenia. Uh, Sam Bennett took two wins in the sprints, but it also marked a really important return to competition for Mark Cavendish, who'd been struck down with Epstein Barr. Uh, he said he ordinarily wouldn't write home about second place, but he was happy enough to actually write to Twitter about it. Check it out. There you go. He said he's never been happy with second place before. I was always quite content with second. I was, yeah. A lot better than I normally did. Well, it meant you nearly won. Yeah. I was always well happy with it. <laughs> uh, right, would you like an update, Si, on the two most talented riders in the world? Matt and Lasty, yes please. Uh, no. Uh, they being Wout van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel. Oh yeah, yeah, fair enough. They finished 1-2 in that order at Ride Bruges at the weekend. Really? And I think further proof that that is, Battle of the Beast is going to continue for many years to come, even once they've left the world of cyclocross, if they do. I'm very much looking forward to it. I know I say that every week, but two incredible prospects moving forward. Admittedly, not the biggest race in the world, but still some decent rivals they beat, including Jens Kerkelera, who recently won a Tour of Belgium. Yeah, a rivalry to watch when they leave Cyclocross and join road. Imagine when they leave road and go to bike gymnastics. That's going to get fascinating, mm. isn't it? Well, yeah. Well, I'm not sure that will happen. But... Well, watch this space. Uh, anyway, Dan, you ready, mate? It's time for Wattage Bazooka. Bazooka! Oh yeah, this week we've got to give it to Domenico Pozzovivo. He dropped a serious wattage bazooka on the final climb of the Abdul Pass in Switzerland. He caught Canadian Mike Woods on the climb and then, in a show of class, he dropped him on a very wet, twisty descent, taking the biggest victory in ages. Yeah. Class. Yeah, that's well deserved. Uh, meanwhile, the viewer wattage bazooka this week goes to Brad Wiggins. Bradley Wiggins? Yeah, we thought we could get GCN away with this because he's no longer a professional rider. But We're I'd not say, entirely yeah. sure whether he watches our videos, but nevertheless, it goes to him for this. Eight months after his retirement, a PB in terms of sprint power. That wow. is almost cracking 1600 watts. That's quite impressive. Yeah, he would have put Sagan away on paper, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would have done. I wonder what he's training for. That's I good point. wonder whether it's the parents' race at Sports Day because that's normally a sprint, isn't it? I tell you, you'd luck out if there was a cycling race Parents race at sports. No, but day, I, think it, I think he's sprinting 
running will have improved as well. He's doing a bit of bodybuilding, isn't he? <laughs> it is time now for hack forward slash bodge of the week. And starting off with this one that was sent in on uh, Facebook by Richard Wayne. He spotted this at the Isle of Man TT race and doesn't know where to start. I don't think I know where to start either side. It's no. reasonably neat that wooden bit along the top tube as well as the basket. But I think you might have hit the nail on the head, no pun intended, by saying that wooden bit along the top tube, Dan. That can never be good. Uh, the fact no. that he's nailed some plastic baskets to the back, uh, that, to my mind, makes it a bodge. Yeah, decent effort, but bodge. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, next up, I really like this one. This is sent in by Marlene Oham. Uh, she writes, when you need the room in your trunk and your husband wells things, and check it out, that is one super cool homemade roof rack. It is indeed. I like that a lot. I think we're going to say that is a hack. Definitely a hack. Absolutely. Uh, well done. All uh, right, this one was sent in by James Locks, who saw this beauty in Holland Park. Check out the details. Uh, apparently he was told it was only a 61 tooth chaining, which is pretty big, I think you might say. Uh, a couple of things stand out to me on this. One, the not so subtle lugs on the bike. Yeah. But two, the snowflake spoke pattern yeah. on the front wheel there. Is it got it on the rear wheel as well? Anyway, that is something I always wanted in a 90s on my mountain bike. Never got it, but just having that, I'm gonna deem it a hack. I think that's a hack. That's just one very stylish bike. I don't know how good it is, but it's certainly stylish. Unlike this one, which was sent in by Richard Biggs. Uh, I, I, but, uh, he's got tassels on his pedals. That's, yeah, I mean that was the first thing I saw. Tassels oh my on the pedal. goodness! I've never mate. seen that before. And it, to be fair, those what is bazookas attached to the back? Mm, I think people he's did educate us on the difference between missiles and wattage bazookas when we first started that segment, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Anyway, there you go. See if we can decipher what on earth is going on with that crazy bike. Uh, we should finish on a high, though. Uh, oh. This came in on Instagram from Hexor2204, claiming the world's smallest 3D printed chain keeper. I'm not sure if he's got Guinness involved to uh, ratify that, but looks you know neat. What, looks very neat. It's not small enough for my taste. Mm. Caption competition now, and last week's photo was this one. And the winner of a Camelback GCN water bottle, along with that Velo Chef book from Henrik Orr, the Team Sky Chef, is Ronnie Dawling, who said, Orica Scott making the hip cool on peak orientation. Get over it, Matt. It's peak down, 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 down. Oh, great. Mm. Great pun there. Uh, get in touch with your address on Facebook and we'll get those prizes off to you as soon as possible. Yeah, this week, your caption photo to get your teeth stuck into is this one. Uh, two Bahrain Merida riders, uh, well, one doing the, the perfect teammate role. Can I have a go at this one, mate? Yeah, go on. Okay. Is this going to take long? Because it feels a bit like you're taking the piss. I can see what you did there. Thanks, mate. Again, uh, yeah, if you would thanks. like to attempt to win the GSM Camelback water bottle next week, uh, please leave your captions in the comments section just down below this video. Yeah. It's about this no. Coming up on the channel this week, on Wednesday, Matt talks you through some climbing mistakes, but we've also got that news from Mavic on Wednesday as well. And then on Thursday, we show you nine magnificent ways to drink from a bead on. The lob is for experts only and not to be tried at home, as you may break a light shade. Month to learn, years to perfect, each rider must be in perfect harmony with the other. As with this method, there is no margin for error. With spot on execution, this is really something special to behold. Uh, Friday is Ask GC Anything as per usual, but we've also got our Tour de France preview show on Friday as well. That race is coming up very quickly now. Ah, I can't wait. I literally can't wait. Uh, Sunday, we've, oh, Saturday, sorry, I can't wait. Enrico Gasparotto's Pro Bike on the channel. Oh, yeah, make sure you check that one out. Then on Sunday, we have another unboxing for you. If you like bike maintenance, this is going to be good. And if you don't like bike maintenance, arguably, it'd be even better because we've all got to do it, but this is going to make it a whole lot easier for you. Then on Monday, we've got a pipe maintenance video for you. This one is how to remove stripped bolts. And on Tuesday, we are not back in the set because Matt and I are bringing you the GCN show from Outer Badia and the Maratona. And I'm on my way to the Tour de France. We're lasty. From Fort Lewis College Cycling in a hotel room in Albuquerque, welcome, welcome to the GCN show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
we shall finish as ever with Extreme Corner, which this week answers a question we posed last week on the show to Simon Andreasen, who posted this photo on social media. That's right. Expert witnesses over at GMBN, Blake Sampson, reckon that unless he had amazing skills, he was actually going to case this jump. But Andreasen got in touch and said, no, he cleared it. And then he posted a video to prove it. Check it out. Yeah, well, he's proven that he's got the skills, that's for sure. That looked very smooth. And when you look closely, like, that's a gravelly pump track as yeah. well. Yeah. Fair play, Simon. Smooth. Fair play. Uh, well, that's the end of this week's GCN show. Don't forget to head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com if you'd like to purchase any of our merchandise. And there will, in fact, be some new merchandise. Keep your eye on that website this week. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the GCN Global Cycling Network if you haven't done so already by clicking on the globe. And then we've got a couple of videos coming up for you now. Down here is what to wear in the high mountains. Yep, or down here we've got that Top 6 prototype bikes. Make sure you check that one out.